the, the uh, two projects are the, the, the top project, the uh, tagging of Pacific predators, which uses satellite technology. Uh, the satellites were already in the sky. The animals carried relatively large tags that could, could uh, carry information up to the satellites. The second project is called the Post-Pacific Ocean Shelf Tracking Project. Uh, and it uses uh, acoustic tags that uh, talk to, uh, that can travel in very small animals, and, but you have to put out a, a chain of listening stations along the bottom of the sea. So we had to create uh, a whole new uh, way of communicating under the ocean for the post system. Uh, just to give you an idea of why we needed two systems, uh, this is the size of, uh, of the animals, pelagic animals in the ocean, uh, and uh, the major, major groups. Uh, and only about 10% of the diversity of organisms in the sea are capable of uh, carrying the tags that talk to satellites. But 75% are, are capable of carrying the acoustic tags, uh, so that if you want to understand the ecosystem and to manage the ecosystem, uh, you, you need to have both of these technologies and have them working together. Now, um, here's some of the output from the uh, uh, satellite program. Uh, you can see some 23 different species were tracked all over, primarily the North Pacific. Um, there is a, a, a few South Pacific uh, species uh, and a few, mainly the leatherback turtles that you just just popped up there off the coast of Chile. Um, George Schillinger will tell you a little more about those this afternoon, I believe. Uh, and uh, of course, Barbara Block's favorites are the bluefin tuna. Uh, this is the track of the uh, Genevieve, the turtle that won the first great turtle race in 2007. And you'll notice down here that uh, she did, in fact, come into the EZ of, of Chile. So. Uh, if you, you did get some attention from uh, the tracking program. Now what do we need to know about these animals for, the distribution of these animals? Uh, these are loggerhead turtles, and you can see that uh, a large amount of information about the loggerheads shows you that they are very responsive to the temperature regimes, and they move back and forth with those temperature regimes. Now, I'm gonna to talk to you briefly about a long line fishery off Hawaii uh, and you can see that in some seasons, these turtles are very prevalent off Hawaii, and in other seasons, they're very far away. Now, that gave rise to uh, a very exciting compromise. Uh, the, this is a voluntary closure uh, of the longline fishery off Hawaii, and it's an optimization problem. Uh, by reducing the uh, income of the fishing, fishing companies by 10%, the, uh, or less than 10%, the, uh, there was a decrease of over 50% in the number of turtles that were caught. Now these turtles aren't just caught, they have to be released again and it takes a lot of time and so the fishermen were very pleased to come up with this solution uh, and, and instituted it voluntarily. So it's a great uh, way of thinking about how to manage an ocean. Uh, in addition to being uh, telling us about their own needs and preferences and locations and travels and routes. The, uh, these animals turned out to be great oceanographers and uh, these are the tracks of elephant seals off, uh, from California, uh, out all over the North Atlantic, and uh, sorry, North Pacific, and they are uh, diving to 2,000 meters several times a day. Uh, and they're returning more oceanographic information that modelers can use than the Argo float system, which is part of the goose network. So uh, the animals can uh, uh, not only tell us about their own needs, but they can tell us about things that we need to know to understand what's happening in the oceans. The post system uh, just has a, uh, the, the primary interest of the post system was in, in salmon, uh, commercially important salmon uh, from the uh, Columbia River for the most part, but other, other groups as well. Uh, and a complete surprise here is the green sturgeon. Uh, these green sturgeon were actually being tagged in, in California in the river systems uh, where they were endangered. 
Uh, and it turned out that they actually spend half of their lives in Canada off Vancouver Island. Uh, and in, in Canada, they are subject to uh, a fishery. Uh, not a directed fishery, but uh, they get caught by accident. Now here's just a, a movie showing you some of the things moving around, uh, a lot going on. You can see all of these different species of, uh, of, uh, of salmonids of one sort or another. And the, the purple over here, those are the, uh, the green sturgeon that came up from California. The good news is that as a result of this data, Canada has uh, closed the fishery during critical moments uh, off, uh, off the island, and so the, this endangered species is uh, protected in both countries. Uh, the, the largest single contribution of the post project, I think, is, is in relation to the dams on the Columbia River. Uh, I'm not going to explain everything here, but uh, by tagging these fish, the, the, uh, the post project was able to show that, that the collapse of uh, the salmon populations in the Columbia was not the result of things that were happening in the river, but rather it was a result of things that were happening in the ocean. And those, uh, the, the uh, changes in uh, climate and timing of events in the ocean were uh, suppressing or uh, irregularizing the, uh, the, the characteristics of these salmon stocks. And this was good news for the people in charge of the Columbia River Dam system because there was a time when they were talking about spending $3 trillion taking all of the dams out of the Columbia River and as a result of the, the evidence, or in part as a result of the evidence from Post, uh, it became clear that this was not going to solve the problem. Uh, another example, uh, the Post system really created a gigantic uh, laboratory in the sea. And this is some work done by a PhD student uh, who's now a postdoc in Norway. Uh, she tagged both wild stock salmon and hatchery reared salmon. And what you see is that the, the wild stock salmon actually know where they're going. Uh, and they are going out to sea rather rapidly, uh, while the, the hatchery reared salmon just sort of mill around inside uh, the Salish Sea. And uh, in the end, almost 10 times as many wild fish got out to sea uh, to complete their life cycle as hatchery reared fish. So, what this means is that with this giant experimental system, uh, we can actually improve the genetics, we can improve the characteristics, we can make better hatchery reared fish. They spend over $100 million a year on hatchery reared fish in, in British Columbia, uh, and most of them never go anywhere. Now I'm going to talk about another species here that we've tracked uh, that has uh, links to Chile. Uh, the Dacidicus gaigus, the Humboldt squid, uh, originally uh, was primarily fished off Chile and Peru. Uh, and then uh, in about uh, 1970, it established a, a new area of breeding in the Sea of Cortez in Mexico. And since then, it has actually invaded Alaska. So this, this animal has increased its range all the way from Chile to Alaska. And at the same time, it also has moved further and further south. So this is a very uh, flexible species, a very adaptable species. Uh, there are several different things. Uh, the oxygen minimum layer has been changing. Uh, the temperature structure of the ocean has been changing. But also the predator field uh, that this animal has to uh, interact with has been changing. The decreasing size of, of fishes in the ocean means that there's not very many things left that can eat a, a 40 kilogram squid, which is what these things get to as adults. Uh, so it's a very interesting story uh, and still unresolved, but we're gathering more information. Uh, the, uh, this is a Humboldt squid uh, uh, being eaten by a black bear in Alaska. Uh, and uh, the post system has recently tagged Humboldt squid uh, in, uh, in Washington state in the U.S. And, and observed them making their southward migration to, to breed. They breed in warm water, uh, but they invade the cold water for food. Uh, and uh, so we're starting to get a picture of, of how this 
uh, system works. Now, the concepts of bringing together post and top and, uh, and integrating these technologies led to us to propose something called uh, the Ocean Tracking Network, uh, which is a part of Goose, as Jesse described. And what this system does is uh, it puts a series of receivers across the bottom of, of the continental shelf uh, or other locations, uh, and it monitors fish that go north and south, but it also collects physical data about what's going on at the bottom of the sea. So it is, in fact, providing a unique kind of physical data that you can't get from satellites, uh, and at the same time, uh, it's monitoring the movements of the animals in a way that allows us to understand how those animal movements change uh, as the climate changes. The, the core of the uh, ocean tracking network is, uh, is from Canada. Uh, we have uh, uh, funding from, uh, from the Canadian government that, uh, that contributes to our partnerships all over the world. The, the first map showed you that we have partnerships all over the world. It's not just uh, in one location. Uh, and so the post system uh, continues to uh, grow on the west coast. Canada, we are uh, extensively increasing areas of uh, activity on the East Coast, and we're starting to move into the Arctic, uh, as well as these global partnerships. Uh, some, of the, some of the goals of the system are to improve the technology uh, and provide better integration. One of the approaches that we're using is here in the, the Venus-Neptune cable systems. Uh, these are large cable systems that go hundreds of kilometers offshore. Uh, and uh, we're test we've tested the system here so that uh, it's now possible to feed that data back on the cable from our receiver systems that are detecting fish. Uh, and, uh, and we're working on what's called daisy chaining that will allow individual receivers to talk to each other and, and send the information back so that you don't have to go out and harvest it with a ship, but rather can get it back automatically. On the East Coast, uh, we, our primary uh, site is what's called the Halifax Line. It's an area that has been uh, been surveyed for 60 years using oceanographic techniques, but uh, unfortunately when you use a ship to go out and collect information about uh, water column uh, characteristics, uh, it's asynchronous, and so you can't really correct for tidal effects. And the, the modelers are very keen on having this uh, instantaneous or simultaneous information across the entire shelf so that they can use it in their models to improve the quality of the, of the physics that we, as we understand it. Uh, so we're not just putting out receivers, we're putting out receivers that can send information up from the bottom of the sea about various kinds of physical and chemical parameters uh, and, uh, and also testing a, a whole range of, of different uh, uh, undersea technologies. Perhaps the real core of, uh, of, of the ocean tracking network, in the same way as OBIS is the core of the Census of Marine Life, is a website. Uh, so this one just, just shows that we have uh, representation from all over the world. We have partners from all over the world. Uh, all of our partners uh, have access to this data set. Uh, and uh, we have regulations about how to, uh, how to manage data. All of the data becomes public. Uh, and accessible to everyone after two years, but in the meantime, uh, there are uh, requirements for how you use the data and how you cite the data. Another technology that we've, we've been testing recently off the, off the East Coast is, uh, this is a, uh, we call it a bioprobe. It's a seal that talks to satellites at one end and listens to other animals acoustically at the other end. And, uh, so this merges the two technologies of top and post. And uh, we've actually been tracking these uh, gray seals from Sable Island for uh, a decade. We know where they go. Uh, we know what they interact with. And, and there are many other species that are being tagged uh, in this region. Now, one, I just want to talk a little bit about this. These are uh, giant bluefin tuna that are being tagged off Prince Edward Island. Uh, and. Um, uh, they're one of the species that the, uh, that the seals will interact with, also salmon, also cod, uh, a variety of other species. So these tuna are being double tagged so that they, they have a one-year satellite tag that 
will tell us exactly where they are for that year. But then after that year passes, we get uh, acoustic tags on them that will tell us what they do over the next 10 years. And so uh, not only do we get a, a, a high resolution picture of what of right now, but we get a, a long range picture of, uh, of the changes over the time course of uh, climate change from these animals. Uh, the reason that the bluefin tuna are so interesting is that there are two breeding grounds, one in the Gulf of Mexico uh, and one uh, in, uh, in the Mediterranean, uh, but the stocks mix completely during the feeding phase uh, uh, all across the Atlantic. And so we need to have a lot of information to be able to manage this, this problem effectively. Oops. Uh, and uh, the Ocean Tracking Network uh, has, has plans uh, this year. We'll start this line across uh, the Strait of Gibraltar uh, to monitor everything that goes in and out of the Mediterranean, uh, and it'll be completed in 2011. Uh, we also are working uh, to put a, a line here uh, at the entrance to the Gulf of Mexico, uh, working with the Caribbean Large Marine Ecosystem Project. This is a little further out uh, in terms of being a reality, but uh, we, we hope it's, uh, it's going to come to pass. Uh, just uh, following up on Jesse's comments about the oil spill, uh, you all remember this was where the oil spill was. These are the hot spots for tuna breeding. This is where all of the tuna uh, from the East Coast and uh, come to breed, including the ones, the giants from Prince Edward Island. And, um, and they came at exactly the right time for the oil spill. And the good news is that as soon as the oil spill came, uh, they all went home again. And they said, what the hell, we're gonna get out of here. We don't, we don't, need, to, we don't need to hang around with this oil. Uh, and they came back uh, across the Cabot Strait line, we detected them, and this was had, had good consequences because uh, the, the fishermen were not really quite sure why we were asking them to take their big valuable tuna and throw them back in the water. But they realized that the data that we provided them actually gave them a basis. Uh, they didn't have to kill tuna anymore for money. They could just sue BP for interfering with the breeding grounds for their fish. Uh, <laughs> now, well, we're not sure how that's going to work out, but uh, that's what the fishermen are now thinking. The last thing I want to talk about is uh, Atlantic salmon. This was uh, Victor's special request for me. This is a species that has a very complex interlocking life history in the North Atlantic between Europe and North America. Uh, the, uh, the latest paper on this subject is called the, is called the merry go round hypothesis. It just came out from some of our Ocean Tracking Network people in 2010. Uh, and it emphasizes the fact that these animals uh, are actually riding a current system uh, in order to have this complex life history. I'm not going to try and describe all of that to you. But that current system is going to change with global warming. And so uh, understanding exactly how uh, the uh, animals behave is, uh, is going to become more complicated. We've been tracking uh, uh, Atlantic salmon from uh, the U.S. and uh, Canada, and we can follow them all the way up into the Labrador Sea uh, using the OTN system. We've learned that they, they all have a relatively repeat, repeatable uh, use of a relatively small area, and they also use a relatively small period of time. Uh, all of the salmon from all of these rivers are migrating north uh, at the minimum time for the southward flowing Labrador current. So uh, they're smarter than we thought they were. Uh, similarly, inside the Gulf of St. Lawrence, we have a, a number of different river systems, and we, we monitor everything that goes in and out here at the Strait of Belle Isle. And again, it turns out that all of these different river system salmon are migrating together across the Strait of Belle Isle over a relatively narrow window. Now, we don't know as much about the current systems here, but uh, it may also be some sort of social interaction uh, that they, they school together uh, for safety reasons. We're trying to understand it. Now, uh, this is a paper from the uh, Future Marine Animal Populations Group at Dalhousie. 
uh, Ram Myers, uh, uh, which looks at the interaction between cultured salmon and wild salmon. And essentially what, what this shows is that in every place that uh, increases in salmon culture have, been, have come, uh, there have been decreases in the landings of wild salmon. You don't, it doesn't really explain why, but uh, it's consistent. Now, Victor particularly asked me to talk about what could we, what could we tell Chileans about uh, uh, cultured Atlantic salmon. And uh, this is the, uh, the longest record of a migration of a tagged cultured Atlantic salmon, uh, an escape E. Uh, and it goes from Canadian waters uh, into U.S. waters, so it's another one of those situations where uh, you have the complication of international uh, waters. Uh, this is on the west coast where there's also a large Atlantic salmon culture operation in British Columbia. Uh, and uh, we know that the Atlantic salmon have bred here, so they've, they've adapted and been able to breed. Uh, and uh, this is Vancouver Island. And this is the most remote recapture of an Atlantic salmon. So they do travel large distances, uh, and uh, so there's a lot to understand about these pro this process. Now this is our, uh, our colleagues in, in Australia, and you'll see that they have a very extensive uh, system of, uh, of lines, like the post lines, that monitor their movements of, uh, of various kinds of animals that are tagged a lot of their emphasis is on great white sharks, but they also have some 50,000 escaped Atlantic salmon every year uh, from, from culture operations. And uh, I, I've been in communication with uh, one of our partners there in, in Australia, Jason Simmons, who's, who's actually got a proposal going forward to tag and, and track uh, the, the escaped Atlantic salmon. And he's been in contact with uh, some of our Chilean colleagues about the possibility of using the same approach uh, in both countries uh, in both cases. Now, I just throw this in to show you that um, the whole oceans are involved in these tracking operations. This is a great white shark that went from Australia to South Africa. And I wanted to remind those of you that uh, are interested in the Chilean salmon escape uh, problems uh, that there are only two places that the salmon go really well Antarctica and South Africa or Australia uh, and we've got it all covered we've got partners there and they're they're just waiting for your salmon to show up in their waters okay thank you